Hey guys, welcome back to part two on Java Poet. So we're going to continue on here on building that class uh, that we covered in part one, except in this tutorial, I'm going to show you something very powerful in Java Poet, and that is the format specifiers that we can use when generating source code. Okay. And I'll also throw in a couple of other specs in there. So if we take a look at example B and we run this, we'll take a look at what it generates. And what it generates is pretty much the same thing as the last example, except I have added a couple of more things. So I have another instance variable here, departure for departure airport. I have the time of departure here as a local date time. I have a Java doc comment that I'm going to show you how to do. Very simple. I have an extra parameter into the constructor. And here is where it's going to get really interesting. This example is we're going to be playing with types and executing methods of types and seeing how we can really get Java poet to understand our types. We're not going to just be spitting out strings. And then I'm going to show you how to put some logic in here, like an if statement with some condition and the different ways of attacking that problem to where we can get like better maintenance out of it later on. Okay. So without further ado, let's get into it. So example B here is going to generate that class file that I showed you. And for some reason, this guy is being stubborn. Okay. And let's just plop down uh, this guy here so we can see what's going on. And like I said, most of this is the same. So I'm not going to you know, bother going through everything again. But one thing that is uh, different is the parameters departure, like I said. So over here, when I'm adding a parameter to the constructor, Notice here that I had the type name in part one. This time I'm using just a type. Okay. So this type is from java.lang or specifically I think it was java.reflect.lang. Let's go, let's go take a look what it was. It was type, right? Type java.lang.reflect. Okay. So a little bit of dyslexia there. I, I hope you can forgive me. And the type name, like I explained before, was from Java Poet. So two flavors here and I'll show you the third flavor later on. Now, after that, we can see that we're still building our methods as usual, but now what we're going to do is we're going to build this get departure method. Okay. Now that's pretty much the same thing as the method before get aircraft ID, except I'm using a string dot class here instead of a type name, right? Very, very easy to understand that we're going to be building a field spec. So ha we haven't seen that before. So we were doing this in line, right? When we were adding a field before now I'm adding it with a builder for that field spec. And if you take a look here, a field is another word for, or another synonym for like your instance variables. Okay. So over here, I got time of departure and that's exactly what I'm building. And I'm specifying the type here. Okay. So that, again, that comes from Java dot reflect. Okay. And it's a private modifier and this is how easy it is to add Java doc. Okay. So that'll get wrapped inside a nice Java doc comment format. And then it even understands the Java doc syntax itself. So you can put that in there. So I build that and I'm going to make reference to this guy later on when I'm going to be building my class. Okay. Now what I'm going to show you right now, when I'm going to be building this method called takeoff confirmed, okay, is really powerful because I'm going to introduce you to the format specifiers in Java poet. Like I said, in the last part, Java poets is not just about writing strings. Okay. It understands types. So let's take a look at that. So I'm creating this method called takeoff confirmed through the method builder and it's a public method. It returns the local date time class, which is here. Okay. And then I'm adding three statements. You can see here that there's three lines of code. So there's three statements. And if you stick around, I'm going to show you how to make this even better in a second. Okay. So you'll notice here, I just didn't use a string. I said this dot, and now we have these special format symbols, right? The dollar sign symbols. Now this is pretty much akin to, let's say, string dot format where you have your placeholders, like let's say a uh, percent D percent S percent F, all that kind of stuff. It's similar to that, but it's not compatible with that. Okay. So you just got to know about four of these and I'm going to show you these in this tutorial. And with that, you're going to have lots of power to generate the kind of source code that you want in a type safer way. Okay. So because I have two dollar sign variables, I'm going to have two, um, 
places to populate those on the right hand side. It works the same way as string.format, okay? There's really no magic there. It's a variable list on the right. On the left, you've got your format that you're specifying. So this dot percent n means a named variable. So you've already have this as a reference, right? Type of departure field. That's the field spec that I did before. And the field spec was making reference to this guy, right? So by name, it's gonna use the name type of departure and it's gonna just stick it in there. So basically what that does is it does this part over here, okay? Then you have dollar sign $t. Now dollar sign $t is where you're gonna have a lot of fun, right? Because dollar sign $t is where you're dealing with types. And T for type can access any type. And this is where you want to plop in here your local date time class, okay? And now you can execute methods off it, right? Let's say dot now. So this will generate this code down here. Now, if you made a mistake, you're gonna get a compilation error, which is nice. So it's not just a dumb string there. So it adds the semicolon and the indentation and all of that. So you can really have lots of fun with dollar sign T. You can imagine all the use cases, right? Now, I'm gonna use the dollar sign T again here. And this time I'm gonna use it with the system class because I wanna do system.out.println. So then I tack on the out.println there. Now I could put the string in here specifically or explicitly, but if I do that, then I have to escape the double quotes, okay? So that'll get ugly. And that's really where dollar sign $s for string comes in. I specify the string here and it'll handle the escaping for me. And again, the semicolon is taken care of and the indentation. And over here, I use the dollar sign n again, right? So I make reference to this named type over here and voila, it'll get done for me. So very simply, by using dollar sign n, t, and dollar sign s, you can get a lot of cool stuff done. Once I build that, I have everything built for my method, takeoff confirmed, and I can then add it to my type spec, which in this case is my class, right? Which I showed you in the last example. So I also said that I would show you the three flavors of adding a field. So over here, I have them, right? So I have add field, field spec, type, or type name. Now, you'll notice that type name and type, I did them inline. I've already explained how this one works, right? And over here, I'm using the type from java.reflect, okay? Over here is the third one. Here's the field spec. That's the one we did up here. So my advice to you is always use a spec apart. Don't inline it just because it makes it much easier to read after when you're putting all the parts back together. And also you can actually put these, hide these in private methods and just get the return type and then put them in here. So it makes for more readable, more maintainable code than if you have everything inline. Cause you could imagine, right? If I didn't you know, have a reference here for add method, I would have to go to the method spec and add all this code here, right? I would copy that and plop it in here. And I'd have to do it for here, for here. It gets really messy really fast. So take the time to you know, create separate specs and then just add them here, makes it much better. Now the rest of the code is really the same. So in essence, you'll get this that gets generated. All right, part C, or I guess you can say example C. What's example C gonna do for us? If I run this, it's gonna generate the source code, but we're gonna see What's the difference here? Come here. Not much difference, right? The only thing is, is we have some logic in here. So how do we take care of that? Let's go take a look. So again, scooch this one down over here. And the only difference over here has to do with this section of the code. So at the bottom, you'll notice I, I added a parameter, okay? Now in this point here, I, in this example, excuse me, I actually inline the parameter, right? So this is a primitive data type, okay? The int over here and the parameter name over there, runaway ID. Okay, now again, I inlined it here, but if you didn't want to inline it, you can add a parameter spec, right? So there's a parameter spec. So very simply, you get a builder for, for parameter spec and off you go, all right? Now this one, I inlined it. Then you have the add code. Now, add code allows you to add any code, right? So if you take a look here, this is pretty much the same as you have down here, except I've added another format dollar sign variable here. L stands for a literal. I could have put zero directly in here, okay? 
but I wanted to make reference to it in a format specifier using a literal value. So that'll take the zero, put it in here. It's also very powerful because I could use a variable name here instead. So whatever that variable holds, whatever value, let's say you were looping through um, you know, some iteration zero to a thousand or something like that, that variable would populate this string value over here so you wouldn't have to repeat yourself or hard code any values in there. So very powerful again. The thing is, is when you're adding code like this, you'll notice that there's the tab, there's the new line, there's the curly brace. Now, this example is simple, right? So you can follow it. But imagine you had like a couple of, you know, structures indented into each other. Then I would have to take care of like how many tabs here. And I'd have to remember all the curly braces inside the curly braces. It gets to be hard when you have more than one construct okay so what we can do here is what i'm going to show you is to make this much better and how you make it much better is an example d example d is the same thing except what i've done is i've hidden everything inside a code block a code block basically once you get your builder you can when you start a control flow right this is a control flow you say when it begins so when it begins it'll automatically take care of the curly brace, the tabs, the new line. Notice I don't have any of that in here, okay? The code is the same. I added a statement here, return null. Again, semicolon is taking care of indentation. And when you do an end control flow, you also have the indentation and the end of the curly brace there. So you can imagine if you had like three, you know, constructs, um, kind of one inside another, this begin control flow you could have another one inside and inside it and it would handle all that code for you okay all that formatting code for you which is really nice the other nice thing is once i build this i have a reference to it right and then i could just add it to an add code so an add code takes not only what we did in the last example but it takes a code block so much more maintainable way of attacking this problem and tucking it away in a private method or something like that now I am pretty much gonna, you know, end the series, you know, just a two-part series on Java Poet here. I just really wanted to get you excited about the library. It could do basically anything that you want. I've actually used it to be able to create, let's say, uh, well, I created a custom Maven plugin, which I actually have a tutorial on. And in there, I use Java Poet to actually go in there and create a dynamic enum for me okay so if you want you can actually go take a look at that code i've broken it up into private methods so you can actually see you know how it reads much better than just putting everything in one big method that's that's a big no-no in my book okay so you can actually check that out and if you actually go to uh you know uh, my youtube channel here uh the example in there in maven 3 write a custom plugin i actually show you how to do that but in that um in my uh, YouTube channel as well, you'll notice that there is another tutorial called JavaFX switching scenes dynamically. And this one here, if you go take a look, you'll notice that in there, there's a class, if you go take a look at the source code, which you can get access to in the description, there is a class called enum generator. And again, it uses Java Poet. So in there, you'll see how I'm adding a um, basically a dynamic enum and I'm breaking it up in all into private methods. And again, this is just about, you know, creating an enum and uh, dynamically populating it with variables and stuff like that. So you can take a look at that code to see a real life example on how to use Java Poet. And one last thing left to cover in this tutorial is really the dependency that you need in your palm.xml file if you're using, say, a Maven, right? And that's just this guy here, palm.squareup. The last version is 1.80. And also, you can actually visit uh, the GitHub there. They got some nice examples and also uh, all the source code and tests that you could learn from. Hope you find that very useful and uh, hope you'll be integrating that in your future projects, guys. So uh, hopefully got you excited enough to learn the rest on your own and how it applies to your use cases. Until next time, guys. Thanks a lot.